morning. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Church. We are so glad you were able to uh, meet with us this morning for worship. At least half of you here and then half of you at home. So welcome to Trinity. Uh, I do have a few announcements before we get started. Open Arms Ministries, their annual fundraiser is happening right now. There are baby bottles in the lobby. Uh, their goal is to have uh, all of us grab a baby bottle, one per family, fill it up with coin and extra cash, and bring it back on Father's Day. It's, a, it's their annual fundraiser, so this is a, a huge part of their ministry. So grab a bottle on your way out this morning. Next, I would like to uh, share with you that there is a book in the back lobby from John Piper. It's called Coronavirus and Christ. Uh, it is a great resource. It is free to our congregation. So grab one, one per family, use it, share it. Um, it's, uh, it really helps uh, us understand what's going on and how that relates with our, our Christianity. Also, I just want a reminder as we are doing uh, communion this morning, the deacons will uh, serve you. We will be going through every one of the empty rows and passing out communion to you. A little bit different, but we are happy to that is all the announcements I have for this morning. So if you would, join us for our meditation. And I know what that is. And it's in your contus, page 354. Your contus, page 354. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us stand together and let us worship the Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. 
He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Psalm 34, verses 4 through 7. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Let us pray. Almighty God, everlasting Father, you are our rock and our deliverer, our fortress and our high castle. You listen to the prayers of your people because we offer them up, not in our own name, but in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. He encamps all around those who fear you, and he delivers us, delivers us from sin and death, delivers us from Satan and all his minions, delivers us in the hour of temptation and trial. And so, O Lord, we would praise you and give you thanks. You give ear to our cry and rescue us from all our fears. All praise and thanks to you, our Father, together with your Son and your Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please turn in your copy of Scripture to pages 294 and 295. Pages 294 and 295 at the name of Jesus.
Amen. Please be seated. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This morning, we continue studying Paul's catalog of the bitter fruits that are produced by those of debased mind, those whom God in his justice has handed over to their sin for their rebellion. Today, we consider Paul's assertion that people of debased mind are unforgiving, unforgiving. It is remarkable, is it not, that Paul puts an unwillingness to forgive in such disreputable company. Paul joins it with these other undesirables, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Is being unforgiving really so bad? Now, of course, we think that it is when we are on the receiving end of a lack of forgiveness, right? When we have wronged someone else and been convicted of our wrong and then humbled ourselves, apologized, and sought forgiveness only to be scorned or rejected, we know that being unforgiving is a bad thing. To be unforgiving, we conclude at such moments, is to be proud and disagreeable. It's to fail to see one's own need for forgiveness from others. Yes, we say to ourselves, being unforgiving should be in that disreputable list. But when the shoe is on the other foot, we are inclined to delete it from the list, aren't we? When we are refusing to forgive another, we have a hard time seeing why it's so wrong. We excuse our refusal to forgive. He wronged me. She mistreated me. She wounded me deeply. He abandoned me. If you only knew how many times he's lied to me, if you only knew how many times she has berated and nagged me, if you only knew how often he ignored me, if you only knew. But Jesus cuts across our excuses, does he not? With the parable of the unforgiving servant. There was once a servant who owed a king a massive sum, 10,000 talents, a sum that he could never repay. And so the king ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had to repay the debt. The servant begged for mercy. Please have patience with me and I will repay all. And so the king listened to his plea, had mercy on him and forgave him all his debt. But that servant went out and abused one of his fellow servants who likewise was in his debt, though for not nearly so large a sum. His fellow servant begged for mercy, please have patience with me and I will repay all. But the servant was not willing. He had him thrown in prison until all was repaid. And so his fellow servants reported what he had done to the king and the king was angry. You wicked servant, he said to him, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had on you, Matthew 18, verses 32 and 33. That impulse, right, that refusal to forgive when others are in our debt is to forget or to ignore how much we all are in need of forgiveness. So what of you? Are you unforgiving? When folks seek your forgiveness, do you willingly grant it, rejoicing with them in the forgiving grace of God in Christ that covers both of your sins? Or do you hold on to their sin, nursing it in your heart, letting it fester and grow into bitterness, resentment, anger, and perhaps even revenge? 
reminded of our calling to be a forgiving people who imitate our Heavenly Father and our treatment of one another. Let us confess that we are often unforgiving. And as we confess our sin to the Lord, let us kneel before the Lord as we are able. We'll have a time of silent confession, followed by the corporate confession that is found in your bulletin. Almighty God, we confess our divided loyalties and that we have worshipped other gods. Lord, have mercy. We make gods of our own likeness and are enslaved by self centeredness. Lord, have mercy. We use your name trivially and claim you for our prejudice. Lord, have mercy. We neglected the Lord's day and obsessed with dignity. Lord, have mercy. We ignored and despised authority and overindulged. Lord, have mercy. You've taken the lives of the innocent and have cursed others made in your image. Christ, have mercy. You've distorted love and merit and twisted your gift of sexuality. Christ, have mercy. You've exploited the poor and needy and cunningly stolen by force of law. Christ, have mercy. You've twisted the truth in word and deed and violated our oaths and pledges. Christ, have mercy. You've preached greed and diversity and have coveted our neighbors. Christ, have mercy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forgive us and deliver us by your grace. Amen. Amen. Like we confess our sins. Rising, we hear God in his justice and mercy pronounce the forgiveness of our sins through the shed blood of his Son, Jesus. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Praise God that Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf has been accepted. Jesus is risen. And so he is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. So if you have confessed your sins, trusting in Christ's death and resurrection for forgiveness, then I pronounce to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. And so, congregation of the Lord, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Almighty and eternal Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whom you displayed publicly as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. But chiefly are we bound to praise you, because you raised him gloriously from the dead, and you've given us new hope. For even as Christ rose from the dead, so we too shall rise. By the power of his resurrection, restore to us, O Lord, a forgiving character, that we would forgive others as we have been forgiven, and that through our forgiveness, others may come to know you and reflect your character, that we all might join our voices in praise of your name with angels and archangels and the powers of all creation, to sing forever of your glory. All he
Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 through 6. Give ear to the word of the Lord. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart, after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. And our New Testament reading is found in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, verses 44 through 52. On the next Sabbath, the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. I'm sorry, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all that region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shorter Catechism, question 39. What is the duty that which God requires of man? The duty which God requires of man is the obedience to his revealed will. What did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. Wherein is the moral law summarily comprehended? The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. What is the sum of the Ten Commandments? The sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. You may be seated. Paul, com- or, Paul. Uh, Jesus commands us in Matthew 28, in the Great Commission. He remarks, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even at the end of the age. Jesus gives baptism as the sign by which we're marked out as his people, uh, identified as his disciples, baptized into the name of Christ and the way in which we take the name of Christ into the world. And uh, so this morning we have the great privilege uh, of uh, baptizing uh, Emily uh, Seitz. Emily's been with us for quite some time. She and Dylan married in the uh, last year. Uh, Emily uh, thought she had been baptized, uh, but after further conversations with her uh, folks, realized that that was not the case. So uh, she uh, is also coming into uh, membership today. Dylan's been a member, uh, but Emily was coming into membership and so uh, wanted to get all her ducks in a row. And so we're thankful for that. Thankful to uh, get to baptize her today. So I will be baptizing her and then uh, uh, Dylan will be praying for her and uh, giving thanks for her. And then we'll do membership vows. And so we've got all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, so, uh, Dylan and Emily, come on up. <laughs> All right, Emily, do you desire to be baptized? You renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? Do you acknowledge your need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing presence of the Holy Spirit? Do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Do you dedicate yourself to God? promise and humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to live in a way that becomes a follower of Christ. Will you, who witnessed this baptism, do all in your power to support Emily and her life in Christ? If so, say, we will. We will. And let us join with uh, Emily in submitting herself to Christ and renew our own baptismal covenant. We'll begin by singing the Apostles' Creed together. And uh, that you can find in your uh, supplement, if you don't know the tune.
continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers, if so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I will with God's help. Will you obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life? I will with God's help. Let us pray. Thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation, through which you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. And in it, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin to everlasting life. Regard, we beseech you the supplications of your congregation. Sanctify this water and grant that Emily now to be baptized therein may receive the fullness of your grace and ever remain in the number of your faithful children through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. All right, a few more questions. <laughs> All right, you can both answer, and then Dylan will ask you to speak on behalf of your household. Do you acknowledge yourself, yourself, to be sinners in need of salvation by Christ? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving and resting upon Him alone, as He's offered in the gospel? Have you been baptized in accordance with His word? <laughs> Swear in the name of God and humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit to endeavor to live in a way that becomes followers of Christ. Do you swear in the name of God to endeavor to support the ministry of this church and its worship and work, submitting to its government and discipline while pursuing its purity and peace? And Dylan, are you speaking on behalf of your household? Amen. Please stand. You have heard these vows that were made. If you would like to receive uh, Emily, into covenant community with you, please so signify by saying, Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father, thank you for Dylan and for Emily. Thank you for the grace and mercy in bringing them together and also bringing them to our congregation. We pray you would pour out your spirit upon them and that they're seeing these parents, that you would uh, grant them grace to raise this little boy and nurture him in the of the Lord. We pray that you would cause them to grow in their love their love for one another, and their love for others. All this we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn in your Contus Christi to page 15. Page 15, How Long, O Lord, Wilt Thou Forgive? Oh.
Amen. Amen. Now please turn over to page 162. Page 162, let Israel now say the thank you. He which soweth sparingly. Pray with me. Gracious Father in heaven, we come to you this morning acknowledging your greatness, praising your name, thankful for your loving kindness, thankful for the community of believers, looking always to your word and spirit that we should grow in grace. We are, however, in a greater time of occupation, Heavenly Father, in something of a previously unprecedented historical opportunity. So many of our would-be rulers are ruling in their arrogance defiance to any word but their own twisted sense of law and their desire for control. They see themselves as so much wiser than any around them, and they certainly do not acknowledge you or that there is a greater king to whom they should offer their fealty. And that so many people, even Heavenly 
father are swayed by these forked tongued tyrants. These tyrants are glad to preach to us that our need to be subject to them, but they show themselves to be usurpers of your ordination. For your ordination is for good and not evil. Freedom under your law and not slavery to the Almighty State. Prosperity and blessing, not systematized theft and confiscation of our lives and property. We thank you that the prayers of our people rise up to you, Lord of Heaven, whether we can congregate fully or not. To stand for your rule above all others, gracious Father, we must be bold. But before this boldness, we must ask first that you teach us to be humble. Your word teaches us that this humility is not in acting as doormat, not in subjugating ourselves to injustice without protest or resistance. So our request, therefore, is that humility, which is the very opposite of pride, opposite of desiring to be our own gods, that we would instead humbly subject ourselves fully to your law, word, your rule, and your kingdom purpose. Assurance of victory that we gain boldness. That we would accept that our lives are not given to us for our own selfish indulgence, but for service and godly dominion, as in the original purpose for your creation. Let us be willing to give our time, our possessions, and even our lives for this purpose. Please restore to us the full fellowship of the saints and our local covenant body, fellowship meals and communion, psalm singing, and book study. We are still most grateful that we can still have scriptures, meditate on them, and pray for them. On this day in particular, we also thank you very much for the godly mothers who seek to raise their children in the fear and admonition of you and to teach and train them for the future. Like sheep have so often turned astray to you, shepherd and bishop of our souls, we thank most gratefully for your continued sanctifying work over our individual lives, our nations, our ruling bodies, our churches and families. Thanks be to you for teaching us the importance and gravity of every thought, word, and deed as you bring blessing for our obedience and cursing in our sin. We know that these times of judgment are ultimately meant for our growth and are part of your refining fire to purify and help conform us to the image of your Son. Any suffering pales in comparison to the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. And all these things we do pray in the name and worship of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we come to you to present our requests because we are a needy people, a people depending on you for all things. If you were to cover your face, withdraw your hand, turn your back, this world would cease to be. The sun would not rise, the rain would not fall, the baby would not draw in its first breath. But rather you love your creation, you delight in your people, and exult in giving good gifts. Even as earthly fathers, we don't give our sons a rock when bread is needed. So much more do you love to give to those who ask believing, those who ask in Jesus' name and for his glory. So please hear our petitions and in your grace and mercy, give heed to our needs. Father, we do see your hand of judgment upon us at this time. Because of our rebellion, our stiff-necked refusal to abide under your law. In your grace, you have brought a plague upon the world to call us back to you. Many have perished from this sickness, and now, in your wisdom, you bring fear, folly, and thirst for power to many of our leaders as they double down on their high-handed refusal to name you as Lord over themselves. Greater devastation looms on the horizon as we are swept along in your unrelenting conquest for the hearts of men. Please send a spirit of repentance and humility upon us, your people. Give us stout hearts and clear heads as we speak your words to a bewildered world. Please send a spirit of repentance and humility upon our leaders. Give them to see their heir and to kiss the sun before the rod of iron falls. Please send a spirit of repentance and humility upon our fellow citizens. Give them eyes to see the folly of their idols, a desire for the true and holy, and cause them to flee evil and run to you. In the meantime, give us grace, humility, 
and perseverance as we continue to navigate our limited gathering as a congregation, limiting of work and education situations and our limited, limited freedoms. May we enjoy the removal of all these restrictions soon as your purposes are accomplished. Please give great diligence and patience to Julia Bryan and Eric McMahon as they prepare for their upcoming marriage. We pray that this soon-to-be household will be a tribute to your kingdom. We ask this also for the newly formed households of Jordan and Victoria Haynes, Caleb and Priscilla Paul, Gabe and Allegra Gullahan, Pete and Kayleanna Dowers, Luke and Ava Zazadny, and Dylan and Emily Seitz. May they delight in you as Lord, even as they delight in each other. Father, give diligence to the families who have new little ones to nurture and train. We pray specifically for the parents of Charlie Joe Bryan, Fletcher McAbee, Journey Care, Jonathan McElroy, Ronan Paul, and Elias Haynes. We pray for those who will soon give birth, Hannah Zadney, Becca Byler, Mariah Espiro, Emily Seitz, Libby Grammer, and Megan Mallory. Please give health and strength to the task. Calm any anxieties and allow them to see their labor richly rewarded. We also pray that you would heal those in our midst who have physical infirmities. We lift up Ken Harris, Gail Harris's brother Larry, Stuart and Elise Norberg, Stephanie Scherter, Jared and Christopher Mayhar, the Unger's daughter Bethany, Jean Cahoon, Emily Brown, Luke Paul, and my wife Jackie as she has hip surgery this week. We pray against your enemies, Lord, by asking you to strengthen and bless your church. Today we lift up Emmanuel Baptist Church and its pastor, Art Valdez, and also Covenant First Presbyterian Church of Live Oak, Florida, and St. Mark Reformed Church of Nashville, Tennessee. Allow each of these congregations and their leaders to be faithful, bold, and winsome in their communities, and so build your kingdom. Lord, you know our needs, that they go far beyond these mentioned here. In your compassion, give us all that is needed for our maturity in Christ and withhold all that will do us harm. In the name of Christ, we make our request. Amen. Please stand once more. Turning your conscience, Christy, to page 327. Page 327, the church is one foundation. <laughs>
Amen. Read to you this morning from Revelation 20. Revelation 20, give ear to the word of the Lord. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the uh, breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works." Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the word of the Lord. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray that you would shower your grace upon us, that we might grow in holiness, that we might understand this text, that we might apply it to our lives, and that we might be faithful servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I uh, mentioned to the A through M people last week, uh, it's good to uh, see you here. You know, I could make comparisons about which group was better, which was singing better, which was more enthusiastic, but I won't do that. So, last week in our sermon on Revelation chapter 1, I introduced an important distinction that guides us not only in the study of eschatology, which we've been studying, the study of last things, but generally in our study of the Word of God, that uh, there are some things in Scripture that are clear, right? There are some texts of Scripture that are clear than other texts. And so a basic principle of biblical interpretation is that you use the uh, clearer text to interpret the less clear text. And this is one reason why in my study of the biblical hope uh, in uh, these uh, 10 sermons that we've had so far, Revelation has been at the end. It's also perhaps why Revelation is at the end of your Bible. In order to understand Revelation, you really need to understand everything that has gone on before that. The book of Revelation, as I think I have mentioned, uh, has in itself more allusions and quotations from the Old Testament than any, than the rest of the New Testament combined. It is saturated in the Old Testament, saturated in the prophets, saturated in the Psalms, saturated 
uh, in the historical writings. And so uh, it's critical as we come to the book of Revelation that we have those clearer texts in mind as we come to this particular passage. Unfortunately, however, for the last couple centuries, eschatological study, right, the study of the future, what does the future hold, has been shaped by one's approach to this text. The very names by which our schools of eschatological thought are called, right, drive us to this text. So pre-millennialism and ah-millennialism and post millennialism, right? One would think that the most important thing about the future of the gospel is the millennium, right? This thousand year period. But here's, I'll let you in on a secret, right? Of those three groups, the only one that is happy with that nomenclature is premillennialism. Neither I'm millennialist nor post millennialist, those names are not really all that helpful or descriptive of those positions. Premillennialism is the only eschatological position that is happy with a focus on Revelation 20, and here's why. Because premillennialism is entirely dependent on a specific interpretation of this passage of Scripture. So let us be clear, right? Premillennialism is completely dependent upon a specific interpretation of one of the most symbolic chapters in one of the most symbolic books of the Bible. That should, at the very least, give us pause before embracing it. Right? Revelation 20 is a less clear passage, and it should be interpreted by the rest of Scripture, not the other way around. So, uh, as we begin our time together, I want to kind of introduce you to how does premillennialism approach this passage, and then how do so-called amillennialism and postmillennialism approach this passage, just to give you the lay of the land, and then we'll look at the passage in detail. So what is the premillennial interpretation of this passage? Um, undoubtedly, if you've been around in evangelical circles for a while, you've seen this type of thing. Uh, if you've read the Left Behind series, you've uh, seen it uh, in novel form. Uh, if you've listened to uh, eschatology talks and prognostications, most likely this is the view that's been articulated to you. Premillennialism in its various forms, whether dispensational or historic premillennialism, so there are various forms of premillennialism. It insists that the thousand year period that John sees, right, the thousand year period in his vision, has yet to begin, right? It is a future reality. According to premillennialism, the angel in chapter 20, verse 1, who comes down from heaven, right, is Jesus. In fact, uh, most all the schools of thought would agree with that assessment. So everybody tends to agree that this angel is Jesus. It's a way of referring to Jesus. Uh, but premillennialism would say that at some future at, a, at some time in the future, Jesus will return, he will bind Satan, and then he will rule on earth for a literal 1,000-year period. After that, Jesus will somehow return again. Right? Uh, we don't know. If they, they differ in how that happens, right? Does he go away and then come back? But somehow he returns again, right? So you've got two second comings. Not sure how that works, but... Uh, okay, so at some point, Jesus will return again, and the final judgment will take place. The thousand years is thus, in premillennialism, it is unrealized. It's not a present reality. It is a future reality. Historically, premillennialism, or as it's known uh, in uh, the history of the church as Kiliism, 
right, which is the Greek word for thousand, kilos. Historically, premillennialism has been a minority position in the church, though it has become widespread in America in the last couple hundred years. So that's premillennialism, right? The millennial period is still future. On the other hand, both amillennialism and most forms of what are called postmillennialism, right? And again, neither group likes these names. But they insist that the thousand-year period mentioned in Revelation 20 is already in full swing. While they may disagree on finer details, right, they agree that John's millennial period, this thousand years, is already happening. It is a present reality. The angel who descends out of heaven is Jesus but this is John's vision of Jesus' first coming, not some future coming, right? Jesus has already come, and he has bound Satan through his earthly ministry, and he's currently ruling the earth as king of kings and lord of lords. He will return at the end of this millennial period, hence both positions are post-millennial, right? Jesus will return at the end of this thousand-year period period, and bring about the consummation of all things, right? The final judgment, the resurrection, etc. The thousand years, according to these schools of thought, is no more meant to be taken literally than is the key that the angel has in verse 1 to the abyss, or the chain that he uses to bind Satan, who is a spiritual creature and would be difficult to chain in that physical sense. These are, this is symbolic language, right? It's true, that, right? That doesn't mean it's not true. It just means they're symbols. So 1,000 is a cube of the number 10, and it symbolizes in Scripture a vast extent. So God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Does that mean he doesn't own the cattle on the thousand and first hill. No, right? The number is symbolic. He owns the cattle on all the hills. This thousand year period is, is symbolic of an extensive, a vast extent of time during which Christ rules from the right hand of the Father. Christ rules for a thousand years. And according to both these positions, he is ruling now. So notice, therefore, that this passage, again, doesn't help us distinguish amillennialism, so-called, or postmillennialism. And that's why neither school of thought particularly is attached to those labels. What distinguishes amillennialism and postmillennialism, just FYI, uh, is whether or not the nations in mass will come to serve Christ prior to his return in glory, right? Amillennialism would answer that question negatively. No, that promise is not given in Scripture, amillennialism would say. Postmillennialism would say yes, right? The nations are promised to Christ. The nations are going to acknowledge Christ prior to his return in glory. But that question isn't answered by this text. It's totally dependent on the rest of Scripture, in particular, I think, the Psalms. So note, right in the midst of all this, that we have introduced another distinction in our study of the future, our study of eschatology. Unrealized versus realized millennialism, right? Premillennialism says that the millennial period, this thousand-year period, is still future, Whereas amillennialism and postmillennialism say that it is already happening. It is the current time period. So, which is it? Well, let's look at Revelation 20. Right, what we have read this morning in Revelation 20 are three of John's final seven visions. Right, you know that if you've read the book of Revelation that there are seven of lots of things. Uh, 
Seven is the number of perfection. And so at the close of the book, John has his final seven visions, and each one of these visions is introduced in Greek with the words kai adon, and I saw. Unfortunately, the New King James uh, messes up this translation by sometimes translating it, then I saw, uh, but every time it's the same. And I saw, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. You'll notice that I've given you in your little gray box up there of uh, those seven visions. They begin in chapter 19, verse 11, and I saw heaven opened. And then in chapter 19, verse 17, and I saw an angel standing. Verse 19, and I saw the beast. And then in, verse, in chapter 20, verse 1, and I saw an angel coming down from heaven. And then in verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And then in verse 11, and I saw a great white throne. And then in chapter 21, verse 1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, right? So these are his seven final visions again and again and again and again. He's just recording, right? He gets these various visions that, that uh, come uh, to him, and he's recording one after the other after the other. So notice that in chapter 20, therefore, we're jumping into the midst of these visions with John's vision of Satan bound for a thousand years, right? The, his vision of this millennial period, this millennial kingdom, and the binding of Satan. And here's the important thing, right? Note that these visions are visions. <laughs> they're, they're visions, right? That's the nature of the thing. They are symbols, and as such, they're suggestive of biblical truth. They are not didactic, literal instruction. Other texts, therefore, help us illumine the significance of these visions and their likely meaning. In particular, I would suggest that John's visions in Revelation 20 roughly parallel Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 through 26. Right, Paul writes there, I've given you this passage in your handout, and we'll be coming back to it again and again in the course of our time this morning. Paul writes, he says, For as in Adam all die, right? Adam sinned against the Lord, and everybody died in Adam. Even so, in Christ all shall be made alive, right? All those in Adam die, all those in Christ are made alive. Then notice verse 23, But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and afterward those who are Christ that is coming. Right? So the coming to life uh, comes in two stages. Christ is the first fruits, he rose from the dead, and then you have afterward those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So notice a few things about Paul's uh, summary of human history since, since Christ's ministry. Notice that there are two stages, Christ's resurrection and then our resurrection, verse 23. In other words, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. Okay? At the time of the second resurrection, Christ, that is, of Christ's return in glory, verse 23, right? Christ the first fruits, and afterward, those who are Christ at his coming, right? Um, then will come, verse 24, the end, when Christ, when Jesus will relinquish his messianic office after having completely destroyed all rule and all authority and power. Right? In other words, the rulers of the darkness of this age, the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In company with the judgment of those principalities and powers will come the destruction, verse 26, of death itself. Right? Death shall be no more. Death, in the words of John Donne, thou shalt die. As we make our way right through John's visions in chapter 20, I would suggest that it's this chronology that John sees, right? And he sees it in a series of visions, right? This clearer text will help us understand John's 
less clear text. So let's see how this works. Advocates of a future interpretation of Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, this first uh, vision in chapter 20, uh, argue that the binding of Satan proves that this text must be future, right? This must refer to a future coming of Jesus. After all, they'll say, look around. Does it look like Satan is bound, right? Don't you see evidences of Satan's continued work in the world? And the answer to that question is, of course. Satan is a roaring lion, right? He goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. But notice that in John's vision here, John does not see, does not insist that Satan is completely bound. Notice verse 3. The angel, whom we take to be Jesus, cast Satan into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Right? Notice the point of Satan's binding. Satan is bound so that the gospel might go forth to all the nations of the earth and not just to the nation of Israel. Now, are we waiting for this binding of Satan to be accomplished in the future, or has it already been accomplished? Well, that's why we're studying Revelation 20 at the end of everything else we said. Because what did we learn several weeks ago about Jesus' ministry and Satan's work in the world? Why did Jesus come? He came to destroy the works of the devil. Remember Jesus' words in John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I am, if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples, all nations, to myself. Right? And Jesus connects the worldwide advance of the gospel with his death and Satan's overthrow. He would be lifted up on the cross, and Satan would be cast out, right? While Satan once controlled the nations, while he held them in thrall under darkness, deceit, and death, Christ conquered him in his death and resurrection, right? In the Latin phrase, Christus victor, right? Christ is the victor. In fact, you may recall that Jesus himself used this binding language to describe his conquest of Satan. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Not will come upon you, but it has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Jesus, through his death, through his ministry, his death, his resurrection and ascension, bound the strong man. And now Jesus is plundering his property is sending forth the good news of the gospel to all the nations of the earth. The eternal Son of God took on human flesh, made war on Satan and his hosts, and bound them through his death and resurrection. And now Jesus is plundering Satan's property. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us, Jesus has delivered us, actually, sorry, God the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Satan is bound until the Great Commission is accomplished. John, in, chapter, in verses 1 through 3, is describing the present age. He sees a realized millennium, right? This is the vision he has of Christ's work during this time period, sending the gospel out to all the nations of the earth. My 
This is confirmed when we come to verses 4 through 10, the second vision. John's vision, actually, in the course of his vision, is the fifth. John's vision of the thousand-year period, his vision of the first resurrection and Satan's judgment. Now, based on the rest of the teaching of the New Testament, if you came across the phrase, the first resurrection, and you had read 1 Corinthians 15, or you had read Romans, what would you immediately associate it with? Christ's resurrection, right? What is the first resurrection, right? Paul explicitly says, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ that is coming. In fact, John himself, in Revelation chapter 1, you may recall when we read Revelation chapter 1 uh, last week, in Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 6, or sorry, verse 5, he introduces grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come, the Father, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead. Right, so if we were coming to this text from the rest of Scripture, the rest of the New Testament, and even the opening of John's book of Revelation, we would expect the first revelation to be a reference to Christ's resurrection and our participation in that resurrection. And that's what John's describing here. That's what he's seeing in symbolic imagery. John beholds our participation in Christ's resurrection. Even now, right, we participate by faith in Christ's resurrection. So, I'm getting ahead of myself. But let's see how all that happens, right? Just, again, if you let the clearer passages of Scripture interpret the less clear. When you come here, you're not going to have trouble figuring out, okay, what's John talking about? He's talking about the resurrection of Christ, right? The new way of life inaugurated by Christ's resurrection from the dead. Notice he writes, I saw thrones, right? This is kingly language. They sat on them. Judgment was committed to them, right? They're ruling over the earth. So who are these folks? They're the souls of those and the New King James does a bad translation. Just, let's just acknowledge it. Okay? Good translation often, but here it's bad. Uh, the New King James implies that this is only one group of people. Um, I think that this is two groups of people. It's not a big issue. You can interpret it as one person, and it doesn't change the meaning uh, substantially. But uh, he sees the soul's first of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. In other words, he sees the souls of the martyrs. And then two, and those, right? For some reason, the New King James just drops that phrase, okay, from the Greek. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, right? So, You've got two groups of people. You've got the church triumphant, those who have already gone on to their reward, those who were martyred and who have died, and the church militant, those who are still on the earth, who are not worshiping the beast, not following them. And together, John sees them ruling and reigning with Christ. In life and in death, they rule and they reign with Christ. Right? Those uh, they, ruled, they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, right, those who did not serve Christ, those or, or those who uh, turned back, turned away from Christ, right, the cowardly and the unbelieving, the rest of the dead did not live. New King James says here again, uh, that's not in the Greek. So just cross it out. Uh, but the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished, Right. They, they were still dead in their trespasses and sins while thinking themselves alive. They were dead. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. Without God, without hope, strangers to the covenants of promise and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2, verse 12. Right, this first resurrection, right? So he says 
Uh, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this first resurrection refers to the new way of life inaugurated by Christ's resurrection. And this new way of life includes the forgiveness of sins and the renewal of our moral capacity. Right? Notice Ephesians 2. Right? Ephesians 2 describes our salvation in terms of resurrection. Ephesians 2, 1 and following. I've given you this passage in your handout. Uh, Paul writes, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. Right? So we, we were subject to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We were dead even while we were alive. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, notice verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Right? We participate in Christ's first resurrection. By grace you've been saved. And, notice verse 6, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus as king and as priests. And notice that he's not talking about some future time. He's talking about right now. Right? If you are in Christ, you are a king or a queen. If you are in Christ, you are a priest. You offer up spiritual sacrifices to God, and you rule over the earth in the fear of God. You are a king and priest to God. And isn't this what John has already said in Revelation? We studied Revelation chapter 1 last week. What did John say? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, again, let the clear interpret the less clear. John, or Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. Right? The reality which John sees in his vision is the current reality. It's our rule with Christ over all creation, we are kings and priests to God. Peter, in his epistle, calls us, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He picks up this same image, and he calls us, do you remember what he calls us? A royal priesthood, or a kingdom of priests. That's what we are. We are a kingdom of priests, exercising dominion over the earth and offering worship to God. Right? We are doing that which Adam was supposed to do in the beginning. Right? Adam was created as a king. He was created to rule over the earth in the fear of God. He was created as a priest to offer up the fruit of his labor and worship of his creator. But rather than being a faithful king and priest, what did Adam do? He rebelled against his overlord. He refused to worship the creator and worship the creature instead. He lost his position. But what has Christ come to do? The reality of the first resurrection is that he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. He has restored us to a position of being able to serve God. And that's good news. This is realized millennialism. John calls this period the first resurrection again because the resurrection occurs in two phases, right? That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Christ the first fruits, 
afterward those who are Christ that is coming. Notice that that's John's name for this thousand year period. His name for this period is not the millennium. His name is, this is the first resurrection. That's the name of this period. We are living in the time of the first resurrection. It's for a thousand years. Which, of course, is symbolic. Just like a thousand is all over the place, including, by the way, in the book of Revelation elsewhere, earlier in the book. A thousand is routinely symbolic. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Right? Jesus is, again, Revelation 1 5, the firstborn from the dead. His resurrection is the assurance that we too shall rise. Now, here's the interesting thing. This twofold hope of the resurrection was typified in the Old Testament sacrificial system. When you touched a dead body, right, you became unclean. Right, Numbers chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. You became unclean. In order to be cleansed, you had to be baptized twice. You had to be baptized on the third day of your seven-day impurity. You had to be baptized on the third day, or as your translations will translate it, washed. Okay, but it's the word bapto. You had to be baptized. You had to be washed on the third day, and then you had to be washed again on the seventh day. This twofold baptism prefigured the hope of the resurrection. Right in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, where Paul's talking about the hope of the resurrection, this is the baptism for the dead that he's talking about, right? The Mormons have it all wrong, okay? Paul is alluding to the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, he's referring to Numbers chapter 19. And this twofold, res this twofold baptism for the dead. On the third day, Christ rose from the dead, the first fruits of all those who've fallen asleep. And on the seventh day, the last day, when Christ returns again in glory, we shall all rise and be completely set free from death's clutches, right? That second resurrection will be accomplished by the same spirit who has enabled us to participate in Christ's first resurrection, right? Romans chapter eight, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. We participate now in the first resurrection, and that is the first fruits. It's the guarantee that we shall one day enjoy the second resurrection. As John's vision continues here in verses 7 and following, he sees Christ's final victory over the forces of darkness. Right? Remember Paul's chronology in 1 Corinthians 15. Right? Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming, right? First resurrection, second resurrection. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to, the, to God the Father, when he has put an end to all rule and all authority and power. Right? Paul says that the messianic age will end, right, and the consummation will begin with Jesus' complete overthrow of Satan and his minions, right? That's how the thousand-year period, that's how the reign of Christ, the Messianic age, ends. It ends with the complete overthrow of Satan. The conquest that Jesus began in his first coming will com be completed in his second. And so notice, therefore, whoa, John's vision says that. At the end of this thousand-year period, we're told uh, in verse 3 that Satan must be released for a little while, and then this is described in greater detail in verses 7 and following, where Satan and his minions gather together uh, against the saints and the beloved city, right, against the people of God. They surround the people of God, right? They're persecuting the people of God, but they will be destroyed. Right? The end of the thousand-year period is the destruction of Satan and his forces. All those who join Satan at that time and throughout history will ultimately be destroyed. One 
little word shall fell them. Satan and his forces will be cast into the lake of fire, right? And folks often think of hell as the place where Satan torments lost souls. But notice uh, what we observe here is that hell is the place of Satan's torment. He will be tormented there. He won't be doing the tormenting. Right? He will be judged. He will be destroyed, along with all those who serve him. You'll notice here, as an aside, that joining uh, Satan uh, or the devil uh, in the uh, lake of fire, uh, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, right? John had already seen uh, in one of his visions the overthrow of the beast and the false prophet back in chapter 19, uh, verse uh, 19. I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, their armies, etc., etc. Notice verse 21. Uh, no, sorry, uh, verse 20. These two, the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Right? They had uh, been destroyed. And so they're here in the lake of fire. And ultimately, at the end of history, at the end, when Christ returns in glory, the devil joins the beast and the false prophet there. Uh, so who are these characters? Um, perhaps I'll go into more detail in my midweek meditation this upcoming week. At this point, let me just quote to you from David Chilton in his book, Paradise Restored, which you have a copy of, Lord willing, if you picked up a copy of that. He writes as follows. He says, the early church had two great enemies, apostate Israel and pagan Rome. Many Christians died at their hands. Indeed, these two enemies of the church often cooperated with each other in putting Christians to death, as they had with the crucifixion of the Lord himself. And the message of Revelation was that these two persecutors, inspired by Satan, would soon be judged and destroyed. Its message was contemporary, not futuristic. Right? Pagan Rome and its leaders like Nero, pagan Rome is the beast. The beast that Daniel anticipated, the beast that John is describing in Revelation. Apostate Israel and its leaders like Caiaphas. Apostate Israel is the false prophet. Because what does a false prophet do? He lies about what is true about who God is and how to serve him. Together with their master Satan, they will be cast into the lake of fire. Pagan Rome and apostate Israel would find themselves on the ash heap of history. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. All those men, nations, and religious movements that spurn Jesus, God's Messiah, will be completely destroyed. They will not triumph in history, nor at the final judgment, because Jesus Christ is Lord. He rules the nations with a rod of iron, and he conquers them with the sword coming out of his mouth. That is John's first vision in Revelation 19, verses 11 and following. Right? Jesus will vindicate his name and will vindicate the glory of his Father. So this brings us to John's next vision, right? The vision of the final judgment and the destruction of death itself, right? What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 26? That the last enemy that's destroyed is death. And so what does John see? That's destroyed, right? The dead are raised. Death is destroyed. Notice verse 11. I saw a great white throne, him who sat on, he sees the triune God, from whose face earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, right? So great is his glory. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and, and books were open, right? They're facing judgment. These books are symbolic. Don't anticipate on the last day that there's actually going to be a book there. That's not the point. The point is, that it's all recorded and that the judgment is completely accurate. Nothing's taken out and nothing's put there that's not true. And another book was opened. And this is the good news, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Sea gave up the dead who were in it. Here we have the resurrection. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one 
according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, right? Death is destroyed. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, right? They, they face that second death. But for those who are in the book of life, who trust in Christ, uh, the Christ who loved us and washed us in his blood. Over such, back in verse 6, the second death has no power. That's good news. John's vision reminds us that the only hope for humanity is through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? If you die... You will one day rise from the dead to stand before your creator and you will answer for what you have done. Answer for the ways you failed to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Answer for the ways you failed to love your neighbor as yourself. Remember Jesus' words, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. The hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear the Son of Man's voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil the resurrection of condemnation. But the, res the record will be complete and it will be accurate. There will be no appeals and you will have no excuses. Your only hope is to flee to the Lamb of God now. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so that when the books are open, your name is found written in the Lamb's book of life. And beside your name, the recounting of those deeds done by faith in him who loved us and washed us in his blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God. So turn in faith to him before that day, because it's appointed unto men to die once, and after that, to face judgment. It seems inappropriate to close with the sixth of John's seven visions. Right, The sixth vision is judgment. Seven, which is also an eighth, Right? If you know your biblical imagery, you know that eight is the number of resurrection. So notice in verse 1, John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. The, and I, John, saw. Right, So he repeats the Kai Adon again, slightly differently. And I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Right, He sees the church in her consummate glory. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then you sat on the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And here are the good news, right? That consummate new heavens and new earth have already been inaugurated. The holy city, New Jerusalem, is the bride, the Lamb's wife. And who is the bride of Christ? The church. Last week, we closed with Psalm 48, David's song celebrating the beauty of Zion, and this is how John's story ends as well. He sees Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the church in all her glory, a glory that shall be real realized fully in the consummation, but which we have the privilege of tasting even now. And I trust that our momentary separation from one another, from corporate worship, and from gathering all together has increased our longing for God's people, right? Our longing to join our voice with the voices of our fellow saints in worship and praise of our God, our longing to bring the fruit of our labor into the presence of the Lord of all the earth in thanks and praise of his name, 
our longing to be strengthened by his grace, healed by his spirit, feasted at his table. And so as we come to that table here, the anticipation of that table, let us rejoice that he's promised to fulfill these promises and most certainly shall. Father, we thank you that Christ is risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that he has made us kings and priests to you to rule the earth in your name and to offer up the produce of our labor in worship and service of you. Almighty and everlasting Father, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit Grant us a longing for the day of consummation and help us to rejoice in that which you are doing even now. Knowing that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies. We thank you for the hope of the resurrection and the joy of participating even now in Christ's resurrection from the dead. And so we pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, gathered here at the table of the Lord, I remind you of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, we have given thanks, he broke it and said, take heed, this is my body which is broken to you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For all right, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we come here to this table, it is in anticipation of the great marriage supper of the Lamb, when we shall feast with our God for all eternity. And so as we gather here and as we feast together, uh, let us in your let us proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. So with that, let us take the bread and let us give thanks. Our God and our Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he gave himself for us, the just for the unjust, that he might reconcile us to you. All thanks and praise to you, our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The men come forward and pass out the bread. I would invite those of you who are visiting with us to join us at this table, providing that you love the Lord Jesus Christ and that you have been baptized in his name and that you're not under discipline with your local congregation. You're welcome here. I would also invite uh, all of you to join me in singing uh, in your... Supplement? Thank you. In your supplement, page 13. Page 13.
Remember and believe that the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can you say, Mary? Father, thank you for the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For Jesus loves us and wants us in his life so that he might make us pure and sweet to you. And so we pray that the name and the glory and the power may ever be here to the glory of you. Amen. Amen. And then come forward and pass out the cup. I would invite you to join me in singing page 267. Page 267 in the front of Christie. When I survey the wonder of God. Page 267. <laughs>
drink, remember and believe that the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will save you. And having feasted with the Lord, let us stand together and raise our hands on high as we praise our God with Psalm 117. the blessing of the Lord, you have many occasions to say amen. May God the Father, who clothes the lilies of the field and feeds the birds of the air, provide you with all you need for life and its fullness. Amen. May God the Son, who fed the 5,000 and turned water into wine, feed us with his life and transform us in his love. Amen. May God the Holy Spirit, who hovered over the waters of creation and formed the world from chaos, form us in the likeness of Christ, and renew the face of the earth. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you all. Amen. Amen.